All right, so for our last uh, tutorial uh, for the day, uh, we have a product manager, Daniel, from, from our configure team. So Daniel, without further ado, I'll turn things over to you. Just tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, tell us everything about configure. Thank you, Ray. Okay, can you see my screen okay there with the yep. full view of the presentation? Yep. Great. All right, uh, so yeah, we'll do an overview of the configure stage of the DevOps lifecycle here at GitLab. Um, my name is Daniel and I'm the product manager. Uh, so along with a great team of backend, frontend and UX uh, engineers, uh, we deliver on um, uh, a couple of the categories that I will go over shortly. So here's the DevOps lifecycle as um, viewers may, may have uh, heard uh, today from prior presentations, it comprises of 10 stages. So we sit in the ops uh, part of the DevOps lifecycle, and we deal with everything that has to do with um, infrastructure. So basically provisioning uh, infrastructure, more specifically uh, uh, Kubernetes and everything that's, that's related. Uh, we deal with operations, so features that empower operators. That would be things like um, chat ops, things like um, like protected environments, uh, things of that sort. And we also deal um, with the GitLab offering for serverless. So basically what we have right now is the Knative deployment into, into Kubernetes that allows you to work with serverless workloads. And we'll talk about that a little bit as well. All right, so moving right along, let's chat about the specific categories. Um, so first and foremost is uh, Auto DevOps, which is a very popular category here at GitLab. And what Auto DevOps is basically um, a CI template that provides modern out of the box uh, CI workflows that are very tightly integrated into Kubernetes. So basically you get things like review apps, you get things like um, uh, you know, automatic testing, automatic security features, automatic uh, container scanning, deployment, all of those things, you get them out of the box. So when you pair them with a Kubernetes cluster, it's very powerful. So what we've seen with users out there is that um, it's hard to get started and that's kind of an explosion of projects right now. Um, and providing modern CI workflows for all of your projects can be hard, but with auto DevOps, it doesn't have to be. So some of the things that we're thinking um, about um, auto, auto DevOps is that we want to make it as smart as possible. So we want auto DevOps to run only when the necessary components are there. We want auto DevOps to run on projects uh, that are relevant. Let's say uh, auto DevOps leverages Heroku build packs. Um, and well, if you have a Docker file in your project, we'll use that. If there's no Docker file, we'll use Heroku build packs. And we want to make it run, let's say, if we know that build packs are offered for a certain amount of projects, we only want to run it, uh, run it on those projects. Um, or if you have a Docker file, things like that. Uh, so we're working to make auto DevOps kind of smarter and cover more use cases uh, for the projects that are out there. The second category is the uh, Kubernetes integration. And uh, what we aim to do here is we aim to make all the things that are hard about Kubernetes uh, easier. Uh, so basically, that's being able to deploy a cluster from within the GitLab GUI, being able to deploy applications into your cluster uh, in the form of Helm charts, kind of a single click um, operation. So not having to concern yourself with, you know, a lot of YAML files and having to do a lot of configurations, but us taking care of that for you. Uh, so some of the things that we're looking at there is the ability to um, upgrade any apps that are already running in your cluster. That's something that we have for 11.9 and 11.8. And the ability to un uh, uninstall those apps. So things like that are uh, uh, is what's um, on our radar. Um, and, you know, as well, the ability to um, cover as many use cases as possible. So there at the, at the bottom of the slide, we have the link that will take you to all the categories. There you can drill down into the epics and the issues that we have planned. The third one is serverless. So our serverless um, offering is new and it basically builds on the ability to deploy Knative into a Kubernetes cluster. And then um, with a couple of configuration steps, being able to deploy your app, uh, if you have a serverless app, let's say, or an app that you wanna run in a serverless fashion, that would take uh, advantage of the features that come uh, built in with Knative. So that would be scaling. 
you know, scaling is very well done in Knative. Out of the box, you can scale up and down to zero without any configuration. And, and as well, you have Knative serving and eventing that you can uh, take advantage of within your app. And then the second thing that we offer for serverless is the ability to deploy functions. When you deploy functions, uh, you only have to define a couple of YAML files in your repo, and then the function files themselves with your function code. And we'll deploy those things um, uh, into your Knative, uh, into your Kubernetes cluster, and uh, basically give you the URL where those functions are being served and things like that. Um, and in the serverless space, we're looking to do uh, quite a bit of things. You know, this is something that we introduced recently. Um, and there's kind of quite a bit of ground uh, for us to, to cover. Some of the things that we're thinking about there is we want to abstract as much uh, as possible from the user. So let's say we really d uh, don't want you to concern yourself with things like defining YAML files and configuration files. If we know what, what those are going to be, uh, then we want to do as much of that for you as possible. So we're working on kind of abstracting layers there. Um, then the fourth category is chat ops, and that's the ability to um, exercise actions on your infrastructure. So right now, our chat ops integration is kind of minimal. It allows you to run um, um, Slack slash commands that in turn will trigger a GitLab CI job. And so you can configure those to be anything you want them to be. But we want to be more um, opinionated on that, if you will. And we want to, out of the box, work for as many use cases as we can. So that's something that we have planned for this year. Right now it's minimal and we want to kind of expand it to cover more use cases. Um, then we have the fifth uh, category, then is Rumbook integration. And uh, let's see. All right, and I, I, I guess we can cover questions then uh, at the end of the categories here. Uh, the fifth category is Rumbook configuration. So some of you may be familiar with um, Jupyter Hub and Jupyter Notebooks. And basically what we want to do here is give operators the ability to configure runbooks that are have like code snippets. So you can wrote things like queries on your database or you can run any kind of action on your infrastructure. And we're leveraging uh, Nurch, which is a, a company that has an open source library called Rubix. And they have kind of pre-built actions for both AWS and Kubernetes that make it very simple to kind of um, write those things in your Jupyter Hope notebook. So that's what we have right now that's minimal. Where we want to take it is we want to add more security to it. And we also want to add the ability to version control the things that go in your own books. Um, then the next category is PaaS. That's platform as a service. Uh, you may be f uh, familiar with some offerings like Heroku that basically allow you uh, to provision uh, compute space for your app. So this is kind of where we want to go with, with, with this. Um, uh, probably in conjunction with Auto DevOps, uh, if we see that you don't have compute space configured for your project, we want to automatically do that for you. And we're thinking maybe having a free tier for that. And after your free, uh, free time runs out, then offer you to kind of take charge of this compute space. Uh, but we want to show you the power of pairing your project with some compute space is, is basically what we aim to do here. And we aim to make it easy. Um, then next, we have cluster cost optimization. So our Kubernetes integration has become very popular. And right now, we see that some of our customers are hiring full-time people to manage their costs, their um, infrastructure costs. So there are plenty of tools out there that provide you the ability to kind of monitor the usage of your Kubernetes clusters and monitor the cost. So we want to build all of that functionality right into GitLab. So we're thinking that, uh, you know, at, at a minimum, we'll start with um, letting you know what's underutilized on your clusters and um, basically what uh, efficiencies you can make in an easy way. Then down the road, uh, we, we picture maybe showing you dollar amounts of what, what you're paying for, how much money you could save, and things like that. And then the very last one is chaos engineering. This is something that was made popular by Netflix, and it's basically um, exercising uh, outages, unplanned outages into your uh, infrastructure to test how, how resilient uh, your, your configuration is. So basically how Netflix uh, started this is uh, by just taking one instance down, 
then they went to uh, high, higher on that level. So all the way up to a region. So taking a whole AWS region out. So we plan to kind of do something similar, of course, leveraging our Kubernetes integration. So if you enable chaos engineering, uh, what would that look like? It, you know, perhaps could start with a minimal unit, a pod, all the way up to a cluster. So we want to make that easy and we want to build it into our Kubernetes integration. And, you know, we want it to be configurable uh, and easy to use. So as I mentioned, you know, there's still the link there at the bottom of the slide. You can find out more information there and you can drill down all the way into the issues uh, that are planned both on the short term and the long term. Cool. Um, yeah. yeah I think so, the question may have resolved itself, but Aaron can chime in here. But yeah, I, I think like when he, I think originally the question was on Kubernetes as, as a service, but I think your discussion on um, you know platform as a service may have addressed that question. But Aaron, just correct us if we're mistaken. But, and yeah, you know, a, a good point to bring up here is that uh, we're not interested in making money on compute. What we want to do is have the kind of the power of enablement. So we, uh, we want to show you what's possible. We want to show you how powerful it is. And initially, you know, we'll start with Kubernetes. And um, once we have um, kind of uh, exhausted the free time that we could provide for your project, we want to offer an easy way to kind of change that responsibility over to you and maybe the cloud of your choice and basically migrate all of those resources there so you don't have to start over from scratch. Um, you know, but still early, so we're doing a discovery right now for PaaS and what the best uh, solution there. We're thinking that it may be kind of a multi-tenant Kubernetes cluster, or it may be some flavor of Knative that will automatically use those resources in a smart way. So it's still early, and we'll, we'll, we, but we do plan to have an MVC this year. And then from there, we'll build on top of that. All right, so uh, let's move on here. Uh, also missing one, oh, there, there we go. So um, this is at a very high level, what we want to focus on for 2019. Uh, so we want to add depth to our flagship features. So the Kubernetes integration and auto DevOps are at a very usable state. And we want to add a little bit more depth so we cover kind of more ground, more use cases, and make those features kind of smarter, right? The second thing that we want to do is we want to empower operators. So we want to make difficult things easy, such as standing up infrastructure, making changes on, the, on that uh, infrastructure, running downtime scenarios through runbooks and things like that. We want to make those things easy to set up and configure. And the last thing is that we want to focus on the developer um, experience when it comes to infrastructure. So things like setting up clusters or deploying a Helm chart to your cluster and things like that, we want to make that seamless. Uh, so we really want to have a good developer experience when it comes to uh, infrastructure. It's uh, the third part of our focus. So I wanted to go over kind of the major community contributions that we've had. It's worth noting that our team has merged at least one community MR uh, per release for the last 12 weeks. Um, and so I linked here some of the, some of the things uh, that you can use as examples. I'll drop the presentation link in the chat here. So if you want to reference these at, at a later time, and Ray, maybe we can drop that as a link in, in the presentation if we publish it later. Um, so we, we see that Auto DevOps is very popular and uh, we, we have kind of a lot of features there that are up for grabs and uh, accepting merge requests. So here on my next slide, I have three resources that I linked that I think may be useful. So those are, um, the first one is the issue board with all of the configure issues that are um, accepting MRs right now. So you can take a look at those. The second one is an overview for our roadmap. So if basically you see one that may be um, attractive to you, you know we're already working on it. So uh, take, take a look at that definitely. I mean, when you look at the issue, you'll see if it has a milestone assigned and um, you, know, you can ask any questions right on the issue. We love feedback. So you know, please feel free to chat with us there. And lastly is my email. You know, if you have any questions about any of the issues or you want to join the conversation of something that's not out there yet, please drop me a line. And I'll be glad to chat with you all. Um, 
All right, so that's all I had for the overview of Configure. Um, if there are any questions, I'll be glad to take them. <clears throat> all right, so Ray, um, are we at a good uh, stopping point here? Is there anything else that you want to cover? I think you're on mute, Ray. Uh, let's see. Ah, there you go. Right, can you hear me okay? I can hear you. Yes. All right, sorry about that. So a little Bluetooth issue. Um, so yeah, I mean, I mean, thanks for, thanks for your talk, uh, Daniel. Just c a couple of things I wanted to bring up, I think, for each of the product managers, we wanted to highlight an issue to encourage people to uh, to work on those issues during the, during the hackathon. I think the one we had was uh, related to ing ingress deployment, not supporting non-IP address formats. Um, yeah, that's yeah. that's a great one. So let's take yeah. a look at that. Uh, so currently, uh, let me see. That's ECS deployments. Uh, let's see. Let me just look for that issue. I know it's here. I don't yeah. know if it's. I can post it on the chat window too. If that's oh yeah, good. please. Yeah, that would be great. Uh, oh, here we go. All right. Yep. Yeah. So as you know, right now, uh, and maybe I can show an example of this. Let me see if I can bring one up really quick. Uh, so right now, when you when we deploy a cluster. Uh, we give you the ability to deploy uh, ingress to that cluster. And once um, ingress is deployed, we'll show the IP address um, that was provided for that particular cluster. So when you deploy a cluster to AWS EKS, um, we are currently not updating that field. So you will see that question mark kind of remain there. And the reason for that is that AWS is not deploying IPs but they're using a full DNS. So basically what we see on the sample here is a full address at aws.com. Um, so basically, if you query for that field directly on the command line, you will see the right DNS. But because we're specifically looking for IP, um, we're not populating it properly. So this is something small. We'll probably uh, have to look for external address or domain. So, you know, it may just have a little bit of digging into the code, but there's already some conversation on this issue that may help you. Um, and uh, basically, yeah, I, I think it's host name what's being returned here. Um, and it's basically updating the front end, so it supports both IP and host name. So this is kind of a very straightforward one. I think that the AWS EKS folks are more used to working in the command line. Um, so it's not like this is super urgent, but we've seen some appetite for it. It has three upvotes, and uh, you know it should be something kind of simple to implement because it has a simple workaround. Uh, I think that people maybe don't mind a lot going through that workaround. So this would be a great simple issue to get started in, in contributing uh, to the configure team for sure. Yeah, I think this one's still up for grabs. No one's spoken up to work on this yet. So if people are interested, people can mention me or Daniel, and then we'll be happy to assign the issue to you. Uh, and then I'm sure if you have more detailed questions, you can type your questions in there. There are plenty of uh, people both within and also from the wider community uh, discussing the issue. So I'm, I'm sure people will be happy to uh, answer your questions or address your comments. So, Great. Cool. And one other thing while you're sharing your screen, Daniel, is I mean, can you show us your like a vision page for configure? Um, uh, Absolutely, you know, and yeah. that's that that that's something that I'll go ahead and link on the yeah. uh, I'll link on the on the presentation because I think that is something that definitely useful to to see. Yeah. And uh, yeah, thanks for sending the link to the presentation. I, I don't think you heard me because my I had mic issues, but I'll definitely post a link to your presentation on the hackathon page so people can reference it. Oh, great, great. Yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, yeah, so let me post this link. And this is going to be something useful, actually, not only for the configure stage, but for everything. So on, um, 
our website about .gitlab.com, we have a direction page, and on that direction page, we have the DevOps stages. It's about halfway down, or three quarters of the way, maybe. And here you will find a vision for every one of our categories. So here you can scroll to the right and you will see that we have the vision for each one of our 10 stages. So uh, configure sits right here. And maybe I'll drop this link in the chat as well uh, because I think that it's useful not only for configure but for every single stage. And I'll drop it on the presentation as well. Um, so our vision page has also the roadmap overview that I linked on the resources on the presentation. And that's kind of uh, what our roadmap, uh, roadmap looks like in the short term. So with this in January, so probably not much has changed and what our focus is. And then it has each one of our categories that I just talked about. Um, and it links to each one of those things that I mentioned. So you can link to the, um, to the uh, Epic when you click in into each one of them. So the Epic kind of has a description of what it is and it has uh, what we're working on next. And then if you scroll down, it has all the issues that are linked to that Epic. But if you wanna know what we're working on next, you can look under the what's next and why heading and that, that'll tell you what, what we're working on next. Cool. Yeah, I, I get this question from people uh, about our roadmap and they're, they're quite a bit shocked when we say our roadmap's public. There's nothing like, nothing, we like to do this in the open and I just showed the link and it's I think refreshing for a lot of people, but this is how we work in open source and at GitLab, so. Yeah, that's a great thing here is that we work out in, in the public and it allows the community to uh, interact with us and that's very helpful in, in many different levels. Uh, but yeah, so that's something I guess very unique to our company. Right, I think, yeah, I, I think we've all worked at places where if you wanna see a roadmap, you need to file like three different legal forms to get approval to see it, but <laughs> that's not the case here, but. Cool. All right, so let me put the vision for all the stages and then we'll put the vision for the configure stage here as well so people have access. All right, so awesome. I'll work on cleaning that real, up a little real bit. Real-time update, which is great. Oh yeah. yeah, that's how we like to work here for sure. Yeah, awesome. So yeah, I'm looking at the chat window to see if people have any other questions. Uh, if not, I think, you know, as you can see here that then you see Daniel's email address and people know how to get a hold of me as well. So if people are weren't able to join and watching the recording, feel free to ping either one of us and we'll be happy to get back to you. All right. Well, well, well thanks great. Daniel, not only for leading the session, but all your preparation, appreciate it. I'm sure community did us too. And uh, have a great rest of your day. You as well. Thanks everyone. Right, cheers. Thanks, Ray. All right, bye bye. Thanks.